Wallace Simpson, scheming seductress or history's most ill-judged woman. I don't remember any love affairs like that that anyone would know about. Keep the love affairs secret. She was accused of being a whore and a harlot, a Nazi and a gold digger. Twice divorced and once Britain's biggest hate figure, forever portrayed as the woman who made the king give up his crown. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. Eighty years later, she still bears this unfortunate reputation of the woman responsible for the abdication when the truth is very far from that. Shunned, shamed and forced to live in exile with her husband. She did her best to perpetuate the myth of the greatest love story of the 20th century. But who was the real Wallace? To understand the woman at the heart of Britain's biggest constitutional crisis, you have to go back to her early life. He wanted to control what she did with her time, who she met, and what clothes she wore. And to her two failed marriages. Wallace rushed headlong into this relationship and then discovered on her honeymoon that she'd made a terrible mistake. To understand why she even tried to escape the fateful relationship with the man who would be king. Edward responded by saying that if she tried to leave him, he would slit his throat. Through rarely seen photographs and archive footage, this is the story of a woman written off by the world. She is a Chinese whisper campaign that should be looked at again. And shown for the first time on television, a love note from the King's dying days that reveals how their love endured scandal and shame. This letter was written 33 years into their marriage. His love for this woman was unwavering. Buried beneath the rumours is Wallace the most wronged woman of the last century. I'd almost go so far as to say there ought to be a public apology to the Duchess of Windsor. December the 10th, 1936, one of the most momentous days in the history of England. On this day, the decision of King Edward VIII was awaited with anxiety throughout the empire. Just 10 months into his reign, King Edward VIII gave up the throne to be with Wallace Simpson, a divorced American socialite. I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. Obviously, the abdication was a seismic shock, not only to the royal family, but to the entire country. Immediately, the object of Edward's affection became the focal point of hysteria and hatred. She was blamed for the abdication. People believed that it was because of her that we lost this handsome, charming prince. The world mocked their marriage and their love and said, actually, they didn't really love each other. But the truth was different. The pair remained together despite the scandal until Edward's death in 1972. They had both sacrificed so much. She'd sacrificed her entire reputation the world over for this marriage, and he'd given up his kingdom for her. And then it became the two of us against the world. It's the romance of, of the two of them, of Wallace and, and Edward, has been so damaged in a way. This letter, shown for the first time on television, was sent by Edward to Wallace on her 75th birthday the year before he died. It says June the 19th, 1971. Happy birthday, my sweetheart. You must rest and get well for your David, who loves you more and more. I think it's incredible that after 33 years of marriage, uh, he writes, who loves you more and more, because I think what this shows is that never for a second did he regret the abdication. He can't imagine a life without her. And it's inconceivable what it would have been like for him had she died before him. Edward, known to those closest to him as David, had a love for Wallace that endured, despite their many challenges. 
But what do we really know of Wallace beyond rumour and assumption? And how did her early years and her relationships with men define the events to come? Wallace Simpson was born Bessie Wallace Warfield in Pennsylvania on the 19th of June, 1896. She came from a very good family in Baltimore, the Warfields, so she had a very good lineage. But, of course, because of the abdication, you'd have thought she just came from the corner of the road. Wallace faced struggles from an early age. When she was just five months old, her father, Tickle, died of tuberculosis. From the moment that Wallace's mother became a single mother, finance became a very real issue. She lived with her uncle Sol. At one point, she lived with her aunt Bessie. She lived with her grandmother. Her mother rented somewhere for them. There was never the sense of her having a home. Wallace had a difficult relationship with her wealthy uncle Sol, utterly reliant on his money and his moods. She was totally dependent on the charity of the Warfields. And this was hit and miss. Sometimes Uncle Sol put enough money into Alice's account. Sometimes there was nothing. Uncle Sol was really her first relationship with a kind of man or father figure. And he was very cold, quite controlling. You get the sense that Wallace was rather afraid of him. By age 16, Wallace had persuaded her uncle Sol to send her to the prestigious boarding school, Oldfields. Wallace was desperate to go to Oldfields because she knew she would mix with the creme de la creme of Maryland society. Wallace didn't have the money of her classmates, but she did have ingenuity. She and her mother Alice became skilled dressmakers. Wallace was always wearing the latest in fashion. Alice was a wonderful seamstress and she doted on her daughter. She said later in her life that she realized she wasn't the prettiest girl in the room and that she realized that where she could stand apart was to be impeccable in her clothes. The bright, witty Wallace always aspired to stand out and to better herself. What you see there is somebody who's determined to make an entrance into a room. Wallace graduated in 1914, writing in the Leavis book, All is Love Against Her Name. Uh, one of her school friends uh, from Oldfield remarked years later that Wallace, even in school, had her eyes always set on achieving a social standing well beyond her financial means. She became quite ambitious. She felt that she had to get on in life, and first opportunity she fled from Baltimore, created a new life for herself elsewhere. After leaving school, Wallace pursued what she always craved, security and stability. In her mind, that meant she needed a man. For a modern, bright woman like Wallace, it says so much about the time that for her, really, all that mattered was getting married. In those days, the number of careers that were available for women were dramatically smaller than they are now, so she didn't have a lot of options. When her cousin Corin invited her to go to Pensacola in Florida, the naval base where her husband was, Wallace jumped at the opportunity. She was only 19, but it was there that she met a handsome young aviator, Wynne Spencer. Wynne Earl Spencer was the son of a stockbroker, and he was somebody who was seen as glamorous, he was wealthy, he was somebody who was very attractive. Earl Winfield Spencer, known as Wynne, was eight years older than Wallace, then just 19. The relationship progressed rapidly. I think she rushed into it to get away from her family and get another rung on the ladder of life. Wynne appeared to be a man who could protect and provide for Wallace. Within just five months, they were engaged. She felt proud of the fact that from all the girls in her year who left, she would be the first to be announced to be married. It was a sort of society wedding as far as Baltimore was concerned. It was reported in, in all the papers. After the death of her father and her time with her controlling uncle, was Wallace driven by wealth or craving a sense of belonging? 
you can see the idea of somebody who has these incredibly high goals, a great sense of self, a great sense of status, but also how she's going to achieve those goals. Yet Wynne was not all that he seemed. Quickly, cracks appeared in the relationship. Wallace rushed headlong into this relationship and then discovered on her honeymoon that she'd made a terrible mistake. Her new husband was an alcoholic. And devastatingly for Wallace, he would get very cruel and abusive when he was drunk. He got very jealous. It was an absolute nightmare for her. After enduring five years of unhappiness, Wallace took a groundbreaking step, announcing to her family that she wanted a divorce. That, of course, was something which people did not on the whole do in those days, not, not young ladies of her, of her position in life. Both her uncle and her mother were absolutely furious and they would not show her any sympathy. The line in those days was, you'd bring shame on the Warfield family if you get divorced. Nobody in the Warfield family has ever had a divorce. Wallace was trapped with a man she didn't want to be with and by a family who refused to let her leave. In 1924, in what she described her lotus year, she escaped to Shanghai. Of course, in the days before jet travel, for a woman to shuttle between Shanghai and Peking, as it was then, presently Beijing, was unusual. And it was a very lively world. Shanghai had a particularly high reputation for fun lifestyle. It was during her time in China that Wallace is rumoured to have had relationships with various distinguished men. There was one man in particular who Wallace had a relationship with, a man called Lieutenant de Zara. And when he wrote his memoirs years later, he wrote about how terribly powerful and charismatic Wallace was. Whether a calculated ploy or through genuine interest, Wallace did her homework on the men she wanted to get to know. Wallace's technique was actually to read up about a man she was due to meet. She would read up everything that they'd done in advance. And it made many men feel that actually they were the center of the world. Age 29, Wallace returned to the US and after 11 years, finally got a divorce from Wynne. Yet despite escaping one man, her financial future was controlled by another. Her uncle Sol cut Wallace out of his will and an inheritance of $5 million. Once again, Wallace looked for security elsewhere. She established residency in Warrington. And while she was there, she met this handsome, tall, blue-eyed, Anglo-American married man called Ernest Simpson. Ernest was in charge of the shipbroking office in the city of London. Rather than having the low salary of a military officer, he was a businessman. I think the number one thing Wallace saw was security. Wallace was really worried about how she was going to make ends meet. She'd seen how her mother had suffered. She wrote to her aunt Bessie, to whom she was very close, I like him and he will be kind, which makes such a difference. Ernest Simpson left his wife and young daughter to be with Wallace. I think it's easy to see why Ernest was attracted to Wallace. She was such fun. She was the life and soul of a party. Ernest was completely blown away by Wallace. Age 32, Wallace moved to London to be with Ernest and they married in Chelsea Registry Office. Now with everything she longed for, she threw herself into London life. She had been drifting for quite a long time up to that point. She began to entertain and she began to learn the ways of London society. They moved into a beautiful flat in Marble Arch. Her apartment was decorated beautifully and she made great play that she was a different sort of hostess. One satisfied guest said Wallace's parties have so much pep, nobody ever wants to leave. Wallace had created an apparently stable life for herself with Ernest, but it wasn't long before everything changed. 
suddenly the introduction of Edward into their lives, his kind of dazzling orbit actually uprooted all her security. From then on, things were never going to be the same again. After moving to London with her husband Ernest in 1928, Wallace Simpson had grand ambitions, which involved the heir to the throne. Edward had the reputation of being someone who enjoyed parties and loved the high life. She once wrote to her Aunt Bessie that she really wanted to meet him. Did Wallace set out to seduce the future king? Or was she simply determined to improve her social standing? Wallace always hoped that she would bump into Edward. Not necessarily because she wanted to have an affair with him. I think at this point in the late 1920s and early 1930s, Wallace was just trying to move up social ladder. I think everybody wanted to meet the prince. And Wallace was no different. If Diana was the people's princess, then Edward was the people's prince. He was adored the world over. He was good looking, he was charismatic. Wallace befriended Thelma Furness, Edward's mistress at the time. It led to the moment that changed her life and the future of British history. Wallace and Ernest were invited to Melton Mowbray for a weekend to act as a chaperone. That was very necessary in society so that, you know, all, all the right um, superficial actions were conformed to, and then Edward could actually have his way with Telma. Wallace later spoke of her initial impression of Edward in a revelatory BBC interview with Kenneth Harris, first shown in 1970. He struck me as being with it at that time. <laughs> what kinds of things now made you feel that about him? I think he was ahead of his time. I think he had lots of pep and I think he was very much ahead of his time. During a second meeting, Wallace made a big impression on the young prince, unfazed by his royal status. She'd overheard him say to some of his courtiers, so really don't all the women look ghastly in this light. And then when Wallace was introduced and he said to her, um, oh, madam, may I say how absolutely lovely you look tonight? Because they'd already met. Wallace, quick as a flash, snapped back. Oh, but sir, I thought you said all the women were looking ghastly in this light. He was smitten from that first moment. He liked dominant women and he liked people to stand up to him. And that sort of fired him up. So it wasn't long after that before he was coming round for drinks regularly in their London flat, the Simpsons' London flat, and then dinner parties. His kind of dazzling orbit actually uprooted all her security and sent her life on a very different course. Both Wallace and Ernest quickly became absorbed into the prince's royal world. To be in that milieu was very exciting for her, and Ernest enjoyed that very much too, and in fact benefited from uh, the social connections with his business. It was a kind of a, a very racy scene. The jazz clubs and sort of uh, people playing the piano late at night and cocktails. Edward offered Wallace acceptance and a passport to an intoxicating lifestyle. She would later describe Edward as an open sesame to a new and glittering world. She did write to her Aunt Bessie to say she thought it was almost too good to be true. So what was it about Wallace Simpson that meant the prince was so desperate to be in her company? Edward at this point loved everything American. What he really liked was American society and American women and he liked married American women. She was very well educated. She was far brighter than the Duke and better read. And the people that I spoke to who met them both said, you prayed to be seated next to Wallace at a dinner party because she was fun and lively and the ball always came back over the net. Though Wallace had become further ingrained into Edward's life, he was still in a relationship with Thelma. 
And Wallace, of course, was with Ernest. Then there was a critical moment when Telma had to go away. So she invited Wallace to, and this is the famous quote, look after the little man. Edward was infatuated and he doted upon her. She was given a style of living which you could never have imagined she'd have otherwise. She was given jewellery, she was given foreign holidays, she was given amazing clothing. Wallace's newly found life of luxury was portrayed in the critically acclaimed 1978 ITV series, Edward and Mrs. Simpson. We'll all take a holiday cruise. Do you like that idea? Sir, I hope you realize what you're doing. That's yeah, so I know exactly what I'm doing. Ugh. You're taking me into an enchanted world. It really is Wallace in Wonderland. For a woman who had seen her dreams snatched away before, this was beyond anything she could have imagined, and all without consequence, or so it seemed. It was rumoured that she'd had jewellery worth about £100,000, which, if you put it in perspective, when the average earning was around £200 a year, it's a completely staggering amount. As his obsession with her strengthened, their lives became more entwined. He threw a 37th birthday party for her. And what she didn't realize was how she was never going to be able to extricate herself from this. According to Wallace herself, friendship turned to romance in the summer of 1934, during a holiday where Ernest was absent. Wallace herself would later write in her memoirs, we had crossed the indefinable boundary which existed between friendship and love. At the beginning, Ernest was very complicit in her relationship with the Prince of Wales. As Frieda Dudley Ward's husband, who was a previous mistress of the Prince of Wales, said, no one ever minds if their wife is having an affair with the Prince of Wales. So in those circles, it was considered uh, very chic and almost a sort of accolade. And Ernest himself was somebody who, after a very short amount of time, he had his own love affairs and things like that. In the English upper classes, and especially the royal family, it was completely normal for these affairs to take place. Wallace was simply in too deep, with a man who adored her, and without any thought as to what might happen next. And Mrs Simpson never really thought that it was going to be a long-term thing. She thought that there would come a point when, because he'd moved on so often, that he would uh, get bored with her and move on to somebody else. She wrote to her Aunt Bessie saying, what a bump I'll get uh, when the prince drops me for some English beauty. Luckily, I'm prepared. Well, the real tragedy for her was she could never have been prepared for what happened to her and the prince's steadfast refusal ever to give her up. After unreliable relationships with some of the men in her earlier life, Edward's devotion may have come as a surprise. Although the relationship was not yet in the public eye, it was already causing consternation within the royal family. They would have seen her as a brash American, you know, with already one divorce behind her and married somebody else. In an Anglican country where divorcees were still banned from Ascot's royal enclosure, Wallace's marital status caused alarm. Edward was questioned by his father, but insisted Wallace was not his mistress. Edward presented Wallace to his parents, George V and Queen Mary, in late 1934. And George V, who was a man of absolute rigour when it came to these things, was off the scale appalled. And he shouted after he'd been introduced to her, that woman in my own house. And thereafter, he refused to meet her ever again. In 1935, George V remarked to the new Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, that after I'm dead, within 12 months, Edward will come to ruination if he carries on. Wallace Simpson was a woman under suspicion. She was even considered a threat to national security, put under surveillance and smeared with scandalous rumours. I think both the government and the royal family were really rather terrified about what they didn't know um, concerning Wallace Simpson. They were trying to find out something that would enable them to shame her and end the relationship. 
When the government ran that surveillance, they reported that she was having an affair with a second-hand car dealer called Guy Trundle. There is simply no way that she would have had the space or even the interest in taking on another man. The warning signs were there for Wallace Simpson. The lies and the rumours were growing, and she was making powerful enemies. But perhaps it was her life before Edward which made her ignore them. And yet not even she could have predicted how far he would go for the woman he loved. He became obsessed. It was a total obsession. That letter is such a cry from the heart saying, let me go, kind of give me back my freedom. On the 20th of January, 1936, King George V died. Edward, Prince of Wales, would become King Edward VIII, ruler of the United Kingdom and the British Empire, and Emperor of India. From the moment King George V died and Edward became king, the situation became much more serious. I mean, it simply wasn't an option in 1936 in Britain for the king to have a divorced wife. The official announcement of Edward becoming king was overshadowed for those within the royal circle as he watched with a still married Mrs. Simpson. The tradition, for whatever reason, there is no logic to it, is that the new monarch did not observe his or her proclamation. So it was a breach of tradition, and it was the kind of thing that was observed as being provocative. It was a way of getting Edward's new reign off to a bad start, and also casting his relationship with Wallace in a bad light. The royal family, along with the government, were increasingly alarmed at Edward's seeming lack of commitment to his new role. Edward, as Prince of Wales, was never very keen on royal duties. But once he becomes king, it is expected that he will devote time and effort to fulfilling his royal responsibilities. Instead, Edward spends most of his time planning parties, enjoying life, carrying on as before. Wallace was blamed for Edward's distracted behaviour, and one member of staff reported that he followed her around like a dog. The court, by which I mean the aristocrats, the courtiers, the aides, those people who were advising Edward and who had advised King George V, were horrified by Wallace's influence on Edward. He had a great ambivalence about being king, and in a way, Wallace presented the perfect way out for him. Wallace had given no thought to being Edward's wife, despite the status and wealth it potentially offered. I think Wallace always believed that once he became king, it, it would be quite plain that she would be dismissed because that's what happened to royal mistresses throughout time. And Wallace never really wanted to be queen because she didn't want all the hard work. And she felt, in fact, when he became king, as he got busier and busier, that this would be the perfect excuse for their relationship to end because surely now he would have to find a suitable bride, a worthy bride. But he became obsessed. It was a total obsession. She was his obsession and remained his obsession all his life. Wallace's husband, Ernest, knew the situation couldn't continue and over dinner confronted Edward. While Mrs. Simpson was married to Mr. Simpson, nobody was really particularly alarmed about it because and there was absolutely no question of her marrying the king. The meeting would change that. 
he went to dinner with Edward and he said, are you going to do the decent thing? He was almost like a paternal figure who was protective of Wallace saying to the future king, what are you going to do for my wife? And Edward said to him, rest assured, I shall marry her. Ernest agreed they'd divorce, making way for the king. Wallace was reportedly unhappy that he was ready to give her up, her future yet again being decided by men. But Edward was increasingly open about his love for her. And that summer, it became public knowledge. He spends the summer of 1936 on the luxury yacht Narlin, traipsing around Europe, having an extended vacation with Wallace. It was an extraordinarily bold thing they did. So they'd be wandering around in front of tens of thousands of people and you know, they'd be holding hands and quite obviously affectionate towards each other. The world's media latch on to this story and the intimacy between the new king and this married woman and have a field day. Somebody got a long lens shot. Again, another moment of absolute change when Wallace's hand was seen resting on Edward's forearm just for a second. But it only takes a second for the click of a camera to get that moment. Only the British press, out of deference to the king, stayed silent. It wasn't until Wallace was in Paris at the end of the holiday that she realised the scandal they'd unleashed. Her Aunt Bessie sent her a packet of clippings from American magazines in which various photographs of Wallace and the King had been published. She had become so talked about that she would be voted Woman of the Year by America's iconic Time magazine. She reads the American newspapers and the foreign media and begins to get a sense of just how unpopular and disliked she was. Wallace wrote to Edward telling him their relationship had to end. I know Ernest and have the deepest affection and respect for him. I feel I'm better with him than with you. And I am sure you and I would only create disaster together and that letter is such a significant cry from the heart saying let me go give me back my freedom and Edward responded by saying that if she tried to leave him not only would he follow her to the ends of the earth until he found her. But more seriously, if he didn't, he couldn't possibly live without her, he would slit his throat. I think it's at this point that Wallace realized she was trapped, albeit by a trap of her own making. The royal family were appalled by Wallace, but took comfort in the belief that she wasn't free to marry the king. Then in October, she was granted a divorce, a decree nisi in the courts. The horrific moment came when it was publicly known that uh, Wallace was trying to divorce Ernest. Suddenly, the horrific possibility of Wallace and Edward getting married was there for the government to get worried about. The government view was Queen Wallace was absolutely unacceptable. She was unacceptable because she would be a divorced woman with two husbands living. The church, the royal family and the government said they could not accept Wallace as queen. But Edward said he could not live without her. Wallace dominated Edward in every significant respect except one. He would not give her up. So when 
it was finally clear that uh, Edward was determined to marry her and was willing to abdicate, to give up the throne. She knew that this was a wrong choice, but she knew she could not change Edward's decision. In desperation, she wrote to Ernest, saying that she wanted to leave England and not return until after Edward's coronation. I think Wallace believed perhaps she could, even at this very late stage, go away. Perhaps even now she could go to China, but the situation had got out of control. It simply was no longer possible for her to, to get away. On December the 3rd, the press blackout ended and the crisis dominated the headlines. When the news finally hit the stands, it was the most seismic shock to the country. I think that the majority of the British public felt betrayed. But it was Wallace who was the target of an angry public. Wallace was accused of everything. She was accused of being a whore and a harlot, a Nazi and a gold digger. Wallace received poison pen letters and bomb threats. She was living in the Regent's Park in Cumberland Terrace. People started throwing stones through her window. She got really scared. She believed that every flashbulb was somebody with a gun who might actually try and assassinate her. And Baldwin also believed that there might be an assassination attempt against her. So it was decided that they had to get Wallace out of the country. Wallace fled to the south of France. Compared to her early life, she'd been living her dream, only for it to become a nightmare. She had to climb out of lavatory windows, she had to lie on the back seats of cars with blankets thrown over her. One of her friends said she left England like a fugitive in a chain gang. Wallace was shocked and Wallace was angry at the way she was portrayed in the British press. She did not believe that she was responsible for all this. In England, the government would still not agree to the marriage. Edward saw no option but to abdicate. Nobody could believe that he was really going to do this. And even his last dinner at Royal Lodge with Queen Mary and his siblings, you get the sense that they were all just engulfed in this kind of shock. They could not believe what was happening. Wallace was about to become forever known as the woman who made a king give up his crown. She would have realized that the world was judging her and that she had become pretty much the most hated woman in the world. In hiding in France, Wallace made one final attempt to dissuade Edward VIII from giving up his throne. Wallace put out this statement saying that she would withdraw from any marriage. And this, for a while, was thought to have actually solved the problem, but it didn't work. On December the 11th, at 10pm, King Edward VIII broadcast to the nation on the BBC. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as King and Emperor. She listened to the abdication speech, which I guess was when it really became obvious that the whole thing was completely final and done and dusted. I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. She was cowering under a rug and, and crying and saying, this, this must not be allowed to happen. This should never have happened. She was absolutely horrified. And rather than thinking how romantic, she wrote in her memoirs later that she, that night I drank, <laughs> I drank the dregs of my defeat. And you can't think that anyone saying that was doing something because they were deeply in love and finally their beloved king has given up the throne to be with them. Wallace had never wanted Edward to give up his crown. But by abdicating, the king had determined her future as well as his. To be condemned and shunned by the society she had tried so hard to belong to. There's no doubt she was trapped. Any 
implication or suggestion that she wanted to be queen and she wanted to marry Edward is simply factually incorrect. Yet Wallace found herself unable to walk away. Behind this This iconic, glamorous woman was insecure, unstable, and desperately afraid of being left penniless and all alone. Her only identity was linked to who she married, her status in society. And so she became the woman who stole the king, this evil woman who'd taken their beloved king away. Finally free to marry, Edward, now Duke of Windsor, joined her in France, as the new reluctant king made his disapproval known. The wedding was, of course, overshadowed by the news that Edward had received the night before that Wallace was not going to get the HRH title. And he literally received this news like a fatal gunshot wound from which he never recovered. By not making Wallace a royal duchess, she would not be curtsied to. And as far as Edward was concerned, this was such a deep humiliation, such an unnecessary insult that he was not going to bring his wife back to England only to see her insulted. So effectively, as long as Wallace did not have royal initials, HRH, they were effectively exiled. Not a single member of the royal family attended the wedding. And so it was a terrible moment for the Duke of Windsor when he realised that none of his family, not one of them, were going to come out and be present at the wedding. Um, so it became a very kind of low-key affair. It was incredibly difficult for Wallace because she became this man's whole existence. Uh, and she said on her honeymoon on the first morning when she woke up that she, he was standing by her bed looking over her as if to say, and what do we do now? And here's a man who'd been used to his red boxes, a schedule, an itinerary. He was one of the most powerful men in the world and suddenly it was the two of us. But, I mean, they'd been through this huge trauma of the abdication and the future stretched ahead rather bleakly and very blankly. The abdication left Wallace and Edward cut off from their social circles and his political advisers. Edward had retained ties with Germany and in 1937 he accepted an invitation to meet with Hitler. There's a big crowd at the station to catch a glimpse of His Royal Highness and the Duchess on their arrival from Paris. Fires echo in their ears as they drive away to their hotel. The declared purpose of the trip was to study working conditions. The Duke begins his tour of inspection of industrial conditions with a visit to a suburban factory. But there was another motive. The reason that he went was he said to them, will you treat my wife uh, as, as a member of the royal family? Will you curtsy to her? Will you address her as HRH? He wanted Wallace to experience the pomp and pageantry of a royal foreign tour. At a time when most people could see that the likelihood of international conflict was extremely high, it was an act of colossal folly and colossal vanity. There's a terrible photograph showing Wallace smiling and curtsying to Hitler, a photograph that quite rightly came back to haunt them. 
this of course does not go down well with the royal family and the British public. Viewed as Nazi sympathizers, the British government wanted them banished. So Edward was made British governor of the Bahamas. Edward was absolutely appalled at a reception when they arrived in the Bahamas because the host got up and made a speech and said how wonderful it was to uh, welcome the Duke of Windsor. And in his opening speech, he did not make reference to the Duchess. And Edward was furious and made this incredibly plain. Uh, and it was excruciating for all the guests present. The Bahamas held few attractions for Wallace, but just as she had done in her life before Edward, she tried to make the best of it. She was a very good governor's wife and she got involved with the local Red Cross and she was very effective. And on the one hand, it was a wonderful setting because it was hot and it was relatively near America, which gave her the opportunity to go over to cocktail parties and to go shopping. But on the other hand, they absolutely hated their lives there. The Windsors remained in the Bahamas until the end of the war but there were to be no more official roles. This rare interview shown on the BBC in 1970 revealed how the couple felt about Edward's status. Would you like the Duke to have had a job? Oh, yes, you? very much, very much. In those days, that's, that's 25 years yes. ago. I think he could have done something. On a rare trip to England after the war, Edward implored his family to meet Wallace. But it didn't happen and nor did it after the death of King George VI in 1952. The Queen Mother, it was well known, always blamed Wallace for imposing the burdens of kingship on her husband, and by implication, perhaps hastening his death because of the sheer burden of ruling the country through the Second World War. Edward and Wallace remained the pariahs. They had transgressed, they had done things they weren't supposed to do, they had embarrassed people they shouldn't have embarrassed. And we call the royal family the firm for a reason, I think, because there is a sense that if you go against these almost mafia-like strictures, you will find yourself in the regal equivalent of the lake with a very large uh, concrete block tied around your feet. Unwelcome in England, Wallace and Edward settled in Paris filling their time with society dinners and trips abroad. She tried to create a sort of mini kingdom of style in Paris. She tried to entertain. She tried to do things to please Edward. But I, I think that she was not happy. She would have realised that the world was judging her and that she had become pretty much the most hated woman in the world and the only way to redeem that, really, was to try to make the Duke of Windsor happy. It would be decades later and in the most tragic of circumstances that the royal family would offer Wallace some kind of acceptance. For her, it was too little, too late. Twenty years after the abdication, Wallace and Edward invited the American broadcaster Ed Murrow into their home for an illuminating live interview to publicize Wallace's autobiography. Do you two ever have occasion to discuss what might have been? Uh, I, I, I think you must be referring to, um, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the events of 1900, uh, the crucial events in, in my life, in our lives, of 1936. And I'm wondering whether they, they have ever preoccupied our minds since that time. Well, now the answer is most emphatically no. But David, don't you remember we always said we would never talk about what might have been? In fact, I think we arranged that pact on our honeymoon. Yes, we did. And it's a pact and a vow that we've never, never broken. The couple presented this united front to the world for the rest of their married lives. And Edward remained devoted to Wallace, as his love letters so clearly showed. His love for this woman was unwavering. She was his life, she was his oxygen, she was everything to him. And for him, the abdication was truly worthwhile for the life he and Wallace shared together.
the royal family had refused to acknowledge Wallace. Then in 1967, she and Edward were invited to the unveiling of a memorial to his mother, Queen Mary. Five years later, as the Duke was dying of cancer, the Queen made her first and only visit to the couple's French home. It was, they emphasised, a purely social visit. The Queen would like to see her uncle and his wife, especially as it was known for some time that he was not very well. It was a small step of the kind of familial recognition that he had always craved for, but had rarely received. This in itself was an historic moment. The first time the woman for whom King Edward VIII gave up the throne of England has been hostess to her niece by marriage, Queen Elizabeth. Ten days later, Edward died. Wallace returned to England for his funeral. It was the trooping of the colour the day before his funeral, which was also their 35th wedding anniversary. And um, astonishingly, Wallace was asked, would she like to attend the trooping of the colour in a carriage with the Queen Mother, who had been so viciously beastly to her all these years. And to Wallace's credit, she said no. Everything that happened to her then, staying at Buckingham Palace, it being recorded in the court circular, the royal family accepting her, for her, it was too little, too late. Edward gave up the crown for Wallace, but she gave up her reputation for him, and now she was alone. She then watched out of the window as all the troops and the royal family came back to the palace. The next day, she did join the royal family, as Edward was laid to rest. On top of the coffin, there was no crown, but a wreath from the Duchess of Windsor. The service lasted half an hour. Then with the Queen, the Duchess of Windsor left the chapel. She wore a very elegant black chiffon veil um, covering her face. And, and she was miserable and she was really worried about what her future would be. And after that service, the Duchess left immediately for her home in Paris. The grief that she experienced post his death was quadrupled by the fact that she had no relations. Nobody in the royal family liked her or was going to be kind to her. She was utterly bereft. Up until that point, she was doing everything possible to keep the show on the road for him. And after that, she didn't have to do that anymore, and she wasn't really well enough to do it anymore, so she kind of gave up. Wallace survived Edward by 14 years, but they were long, lonely years, and her health had deteriorated. And she eventually ended up on a life support machine and basically lay for 10 years on a bed while things disappeared from the house and the whole situation was absolutely terrible she became a prisoner in her own home. Nobody was allowed in. It was the most terrible, devastating act. And she died alone, emaciated, a prisoner in her own home. After her death in 1986, her funeral was held at St George's Chapel, Windsor, attended by the royal family. I remember one of her friends who was there in the chapel, um, as I was too, actually, um, this friend of hers said, uh, what was done for the Duchess of Windsor that day was everything the Duke could have possibly wanted. Uh, the coffin in the middle of the choir of St George's Chapel, the beautiful singing, the candlelight, all the royal family around. Um, if he did look down on it, he would have been very impressed by the scene. She was buried next to the Duke of Windsor in the grounds of Frogmore House. In British history, few romances can rival that of the king who gave up his throne for the woman he loved. But for Wallace, 
there was no fairy tale ending, as she revealed in this rare interview for the BBC in 1970. Do you have any regrets when you look back on your life? Oh, about certain things, yes. I wish it could have been different. But I mean, I'm extremely happy and... Now, she have had some hard times, but who hasn't? So you just have to learn to live with that. I see Wallace's life as really rather sad because she had to depend on men and she was blamed for the abdication, for a constitutional crisis, when actually it was Edward, it was the king, who was the one hunting her, who was so desperate to have her by his side. There's no question she did not want to marry him. She did not want to force him from the throne. And she very much wanted him to remain as King of England. In Edward, Wallace had found a man who loved her completely. But she paid a high price, becoming one of history's most vilified women. I think she did her best in a very, very difficult situation. And I think that she, of all people, really, for her, there should be a public apology. I hope that we'll revisit history and we'll look at Wallace as a woman wronged, a woman written off by a powerful male establishment who we didn't get to know, who we didn't understand and who was misread, uh, when actually she was a woman who had many positive qualities that should have been celebrated.